Hi, we're looking at the strange case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. This is a literature short. These are short videos designed to revise each chapter of Jekyll and Hyde. And we're going to now look at chapter one, the story of the door. This will be a really short video. We're going to look briefly at the events of the chapter and then comment on three quotations. First, the events of this chapter. We meet Utterson. He's a lawyer. He's a well-respected man who enjoys Sunday walks through London. You may have learnt about the flaneur, a man who walks the streets and knows the city inside out. If so, you could return to this concept in your revision of this chapter. Walking with Utterson is Enfield. Enfield is a distant cousin of Utterson and they walk together every Sunday. Although Enfield disapproves of gossip, and the two men often walk for long stretches without speaking, Enfield actually tells Utterson about the incident of the trampling of the girl. We're also told that he's the well-known man about town, so perhaps he's a little more lively and sociable than Utterson. Remember that we're just revising this chapter. You should already be familiar with it. You should reread the chapter now if you haven't done so already. In this chapter, the two men walk together and pass a door in a sinister block of a building. This prompts Enfield to disclose to Utterson a story of the trampling of a young girl by an unpleasant man. Enfield blackmails the man to pay the girl's family for her injuries and distress. Enfield recalls how the man used a key to open the door, the very same door that he and Utterson have just walked past. And the man then returns with the blackmail money. Now, Enfield tells Utterson that the man's name was Hyde. At the end of the chapter, the two men feel ashamed of their gossip and agree not to return to the matter again. We're now going to look at three quotations from this chapter. To start with, let's consider this one. Marks of prolonged and sordid negligence. It's part of the description of the door. When we discuss the impact of quotations, it's important that we zoom in on key words. We need to be really specific here. Let's start with the word prolonged. Now, of course, we can give synonyms for the word in the first instance. This means long or drawn out. However, it's rarely a positive word. This word implies that something has perhaps gone on for longer than wanted or intended. Coupled with sordid, which means immoral or distasteful, we have a description of a door that has been neglected in the way that perhaps reflects something deeper. Because often, descriptions of the setting reflect something deeper, sometimes characters or themes or deeper ideas about behaviour, and this is just what Stevenson's doing here. The door bears marks of prolonged and sordid negligence. And as we've just said, this reflects the sordid side that lies within each of us, which is one of the key messages of duality from Stevenson. You could make similar comments about the adjectives blistered and disdained. Of course, there's a literal interpretation to be had here. We imagine blistered and stained paint, but once more we need to look beyond this. Something blistered and disdained is surely reflective of something damaged and corrupted, once again mirroring the idea of a darkness that lies inside us, and indeed, a darkness that lies beyond that door. Another quotation we can look at now is, I am ashamed of my long tongue. Let us make a bargain never to refer to this again. It's Enfield who says this, right at the end of the chapter, and here we get a real sense of the importance of respectability and reputation in Victorian London. We know from our studies of the context that the men avoided gossip. It was seen as damaging to their respectable reputations, and Enfield is swift to shut down the conversation. Notice how he said he is ashamed of his long tongue. Now, I wouldn't bother too much with the detail of long tongue. It's simply an old slang phrase. If you had a long tongue, you were a gossip. But the concept of shame here is interesting. It's perhaps the introduction of a theme that presents itself throughout the novel. The men are desperate to avoid any tarnish to their reputation, to the point that it was felt to be shameful to gossip. But we also see a sharp juxtaposition with Hyde, who behaves without much shame at all. We know that Jekyll wanted to be free of the shame that came as a result of experiencing the pleasure he felt at his darker, hidden side. Indeed, in chapter 10, he describes being plunged in shame and 
an almost morbid sense of shame at his concealed pleasures, at the duplicity which he recognised inside himself. So this line, which is part of the dialogue that draws this chapter to a close, sets the scene for the reader. We understand that these men avoid gossip at all costs for fear of shame. Yet this line comes immediately after they have essentially just gossiped and the gossip that they've just had has triggered the sequence of events to unfold the tale. We get a sense of the thin layer of respectability that hides a messy and debauched world underneath. The second part of this quotation, let us make a bargain never to refer to this again, also epitomises the relentless cover-ups that dominate the novel. We know that it's full of secrets and lies, and this is no exception. There's a sense of the hidden, or unspoken truths, permeating everything right down to these cousins on a walk. This helps us to understand the extent of the repression in the novel. There's also a sense of urgency to hide or suppress or cover up anything that could throw doubt onto one's reputation. Notice how firm and insistent Stevenson's language for Enfield is here. Let us make a bargain never to refer to this again. The reader understands the importance of this message. OK, we'll leave it here. I'll be back soon with another video focusing on chapter two. And for now, thanks for watching.